talk about uh, something here, the presence of God, chapter 18 of the book of Acts, and we're going to see this man, the Apostle Paul, who was a pattern of long-suffering. He said, when I am weak, he was a man had, it was a pattern of long-suffering. He, I think the element in various parts of the country that's missing in concerning biblical Christianity is the element of a matter of life and death. You see, for the Apostle Paul to live, it was precious because of the persecution. And it was a matter of life and death. And for some people fighting, not because of persecution, they're fighting, it's a matter of life and death. So we see the Apostle Paul here who is going through all kinds of persecution and boy, the list is so long in the book of 2 Corinthians of the things that he had to go through. But we see the book of Acts gives his epistles depth. When you read the epistles, that's one thing. But when you read the book of Acts showing you something about that epistle, that is what gives you depth. So <clears throat> we're going to see some things here in the life of the apostle Paul in the book of Acts where God is manifesting himself to the apostle Paul. Just like God wants to manifest himself to you in these last days. Paul was in the first century. We are in the last century. Paul had to cut through all the gaff of paganism and start this new movement called Christianity, along with the apostles. And here we are at the end of the church age, and we have a lot of stuff we have to cut through. And uh, there are a number of people just simply forgetting about God. Now, let me ask you this question. You don't have to raise your hand or make a peep. Uh, just how many of you thought about the presence of God on your way to church here? Where you really make a consciousness, conscious effort when you're talking and acknowledging he's right there in the car with you. Now, there's folks who can go to church and leave church and come to church and leave church, and they really, ne really never did make a conscious effort to think on his presence. Like, as I'm speaking to you right now, I'm, I'm acknowledging the fact in my own heart and mind, he's here. Amen. And we need that today. Amen. When you go in your kitchen, are you conscious of his presence? When you go down the hallway, are you conscious of his presence? When you're driving your car, we have so many distractions in our world today in modern civilization. You know, you've got the ambulance, the fire truck, uh, the red light, the green light, the red, this, this sign, the exit sign, the oasis, this, the truck and the noise and all the, I slept again and I purposely wanted my room number changed on the top floor so that nobody would be dancing or exercising over my head while I'm trying to sleep. Well, somebody beside me decided that one o'clock and two o'clock in the morning, constantly slam the door, so that was really fun. And you can't get away from it. I mean, it, it's all over the place, noise. But I, I like quietness, you know? Once in a while, you have to just get away from everything. And that is what I believe, a quiet time is so necessary, and then so that throughout the day, you're more armed to acknowledge God's presence. So that's what we're gonna see in the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul, he comes, let's read chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. Anti-Semitism. Look at that. And came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, that is Paul, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit, testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So let's go down to verse 9. Now watch this. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid. Now why would the Lord say that? Because he probably was afraid. You read in one place in 2 Corinthians, he said, fear is within. You know, Paul most likely was a man that was thin. It said he fasted oft. Even when he wanted to eat, he couldn't. He was beat up many times. 
He had to deal with people letting him down in a basket. He ran for his life. Have you been there yet? Because of biblical Christianity? Because you're standing out in the street and preaching the gospel? We're far from that. At least now we are. We don't know for sure what's going to happen, but uh, we don't see we're a little bit distant from this, where Paul, he needed such a manifestation of God because his life was threatened. And it was a constant threat. Those bloodhounds were after his hide. And so, it, it, what does it say here? Be not afraid, hold not thy peace. Uh, for, now watch this, because, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. So, be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. There is assurance. And then, for I am with thee, there is God's presence. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. That's God's protection. And then also, for I have much people in the city, because I have a lot of people here. I want you not to be afraid, Paul. I want you to witness. And this is the purpose. God, we just talked about that in Sunday school. God will give you handfuls of purpose. He'll give you a reason to do why you ought to be doing what he wants you to do. Amen. You know, when I, I, I preached in the Scamby County Jail, that was a one-time deal. It was just a miracle. I got in there to preach, and the, uh, the man that runs that ministry said, why are you here? Well, that's very easy for me to answer. Jesus Christ is my main reason. And if I get, ever get discouraged or I'm weak and I'm out, I just think on the Lord. A man said one time, uh, don't be discouraged because Jesus isn't. Present tense. I like that. Don't be discouraged because Jesus isn't. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this hour. Help us, dear Lord, that we can uh, uh, work on acknowledging your presence, no matter where we're at, on the job, at the home, in the kitchen, no matter where we're at, out in the yard, out on the street, out on the basketball court, no matter where it's at, dear Lord God, you're everywhere. And Lord, help us to acknowledge that and know of your presence, dear Lord when we talk to you, or when we sing, or even when we're preaching. And Lord, we ask and pray these things. And we pray it that you would be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So here's Paul, he comes to Corinth. It's a wicked city. He comes from Athens to Corinth. Corinth is a commercial, lustful, wicked city. Just like Chicago, or Los Angeles, or Nashville, or, uh, or wherever. Where there's big cities, I don't know where there's a city that's not full of this stuff. You know, lust and sin and wickedness and uh, the commercialism. So here's Paul. He's in this, this corrupt city. And it, that corruption even affected the church there in Corinth. They had a number of problems. And so he's in a difficult place. Now, how many of you are in a difficult place in your life? You've got a decision to make. You're in a it could be something financial with a relationship. It could be uh, the job. It could be this. It could be that. It could be whatever it can be. And there's a lot of whatever it is today. <laughs> I mean, uh, we saw what Lenin's philosophy was and how they're just trying to break the middle class. And, you know, like one lady said, now I got this bill, $600. I got to pay another 600 bucks a year. Where'd that come from? So, We've got to deal with this kind of stuff. And Paul was in a difficult situation. He needed encouragement, just like you. He's no special man. He's no different from me and you. He's made of flesh and blood. He said he had that problem in Romans 7. Even when he wanted to do right, he couldn't because that flesh is doing just the opposite. And he had to deal with that thing and deal with that thing. And I don't believe it was just a short little prayer. I believe that guy would really pour his heart out, like someone like David who would pour his heart out. And you want to see emotion, you read those Psalms, man, that king, he had some problems too. A boy uh, wanting, wanting to kill him and Saul wanting to kill him and 21 attempts by Saul after David, and it was a matter of life and death again. And so Paul is in this extremely difficult situation. So what I want to say, first of all, that the Lord was with Paul in his person. He said, I 
in with you. Man, that's great to know. Amen. Especially when you read Christ in you, the hope of glory in the book of Colossians, where you have the word Laodicea mentioned five times. And then in the next chapter, chapter 2, it talks about the spiritual circumcision and to seal His presence in you because He cut the body of flesh from your soul and your soul is secured for, for eternity, Amen. for all eternity, Amen. forever and ever. That's good to know these days when you pass all kinds of churches today and they're all bombarding you, teaching you, you can lose your salvation. And they don't know whether they're coming or going. I know and I have assurance just because the Lord said, I am with you. Now, that word with is the key to all training, whether you're saved or not. Man's not saved. You have to be with a trainer and a trainee. They have to be with each other to be properly trained. With. Enoch walked with God. It says it twice. Enoch walked. You know what it says about Joseph that God was Joseph. You know what it says about uh, Noah, that Noah walked? That's the key to all training. Paul said there in Acts 16, he said that, he, it said that Paul would have Timothy to go with him. When those apostles preached, those people around there noticed that those apostles had been with Jesus. See, you have to be with the Lord, and the Lord is with you doctrinally, we got to lay down this foundation that Christ in you, the hope of glory for all eternity, not bad for a freebie. You got it free and you are eternally secured for all eternity. That ought to help you at least a little bit when you're down and you're weak. Now I'll ask you another question. You don't have to answer me out loud. How many of you right now sense that you are really weak? And you're having a time of it getting out of bed at times or just moving or something and it grows on you and it grows on you and we better get what we know out, Brother Wilson and myself, because the weaker we get, we don't have the energy we used to have. And when you're going through spiritual battles, you may not have the physical stamina and you need God to work in you and you need to acknowledge His presence no matter where you go. You get in that car, stop and think for just a couple of seconds. Thank you, Lord, you're here. And you know, you go home, he's there. And he's waiting. And he's going to see and weigh every spirit, what word and what thoughts you're thinking of. Wow, that's powerful. You know, a guy said, an atheist told, told, told a Christian, he said, I know where God is not. And that Christian's trying to tell him, well, God is everywhere. And that atheist said, I know where God's not. And that Christian looked at him and said, where is God not? And he said, in the thoughts of many Christians. Man, that's a good one there. Ouch. You know? And so here's Paul. It's a judicial thing. We've got to start with that because all Scripture is first for doctrine. And the doctrinal thing, you know, I was out West Coast there in Northwest, and one preacher, he said, you know, my dad and my mom, they're saved, and they raised me in a Christian home. They've done so much for me. I feel like I owe them. And you know, Jesus Christ has done so much for us, giving you and me eternal life. And no matter how wicked you know your heart is and how bad Paul thought about himself, he said, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He said that toward the end of his life. And he's beginning to see what God saw all along. That heart of that old man, he's a terror. But I can appreciate what Jesus Christ did for me. And I got that new heart in me. And I got that new man in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. For all eternity. That's over there in uh, Colossians. So uh, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 23. Now look at here. Another occasion where the Lord manifests himself to the apostle Paul. Paul is standing in defense before the Jerusalem council. And it says in verse 11, oh, of course in verse 9 you got the scribes and the Pharisees, they're all over his hide. The Sadducees in verse 6, the Pharisees in verse 6, the council in verse 6. You, you're talking about Paul being outnumbered. Do you know when you read Acts chapter 6, you got 10 groups, the Libertines, 
the Alexandrians, you got the, this group and that group, and you look in Acts chapter 16, you've got 10 groups to one man, Stephen. 10 to one. You know what, folks? We are outnumbered, but we can have and have that practical assurance of the presence of God in our life. And we need that. <clears throat> and look what it says in verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Look at chapter 27. Chapter 27. This is the Lord manifesting his presence to the Apostle Paul, just like you and me need it every day, every minute of the day. Look what it says in verse 27. Now, he's having a shipwreck here. The guy's going through a shipwreck. You know what he needed? He needed assurance of God's presence. Look what it says here in verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. You see that? Here he was, a prisoner, he becomes almost the captain of the ship. And he's leading all these people in prayer. You talk about getting a dose from heaven and God manifesting his presence. What that will do when you're conscious of God's presence and you know that his person is with you for all eternity, despite all this little stuff on this little old earth. Have you thought about how little this earth is? For instance, you take this pen and the point of this pen, let's say that's earth. Now, have you found yourself on this little old earth here? <laughs> Where are you at? I don't know. I can't see myself. It's a little small earth compared to all the worlds that God has created and how big God is that he's everywhere. Yeah. And he's wanting to manifest his presence to you, his person to you. And he's, uh, so Paul is on his way to Rome. He was going to the time of his departure. And when you, when you go to an airport, you see uh, arrivals and departures. Well, maybe the time of our departure is getting very, very close. And Paul said at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all forsook me, notwithstanding the Lord stood with, W-I-T-H. He stood with me. And that's why Paul could stand, because he's getting this manifestation of God's presence. And so that's our first point. Now, David Livingston, uh, he was a missionary down there in Africa, and uh, he was surrounded by a bunch of savages in Africa. And the leader wanted to take his head off. So they surrounded his house, and he even actually, he actually wrote, uh, it is evening, I feel much turmoil and fear in the prospect of having all my plans knocked on the head by savages who are just now outside the camp. And people that recognize his handwriting could see that he was nervous when he was writing. And then he rem remembered Matthew 28, and 29, uh, 28, 19, 20, go into all the world and preach and teach all nations, and lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. So when, when Livingston read that and remembered that and heard that in his conscience, he said, those are the words of a gentleman. And then when he kept writing, he calmed down and they recognized that his, his writing was very smooth because of the presence and acknowledging the presence of God. So what happened? Uh, after a few months, some of them were saved, those savages. Well, lo and behold, Livingston goes back to Scotland on furlough and a man comes up to him with a prayer book and he calls the actual date, January 14th, 1856. And uh, Livingston says, so what of it? That man said that that night they had a prayer meeting and there were 47 men that were there for the prayer meeting. That's what that savage said. There were 47 men that surrounded his house he told that to Livingston. He said, we didn't kill you because we saw 47 men surrounding your house, armed men surrounding your house. 
And he goes back on furlough and a guy calls the day and he said, when we had a prayer meeting, 47 men were here for that prayer meeting. Amen. You say, what is that? I don't know what that is. I know this. That's God. Yeah. That's the Lord. Secondly, back to chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Now, Paul comes from Athens. He doesn't expect to see uh, Aquila and Priscilla there. And they're coming from Rome because something very negative, anti-Semitism. And they come from Rome to Corinth. He comes from Athens to Corinth. And there they meet. And he finds out they're Jews. And he's a Jew. And he finds out that uh, uh, anti-Semitism, and he's experiencing anti-Semitism. And uh, they're tent makers, and he's a tent maker. You see, what is that? That's the presence of God in his providence. When you take one step, brother, God is taking ten steps. He's way ahead of the program. When you're playing checkers, God, your Savior, is playing chess. And he's a chess master. And the only way you can, how many play chess here? How many know what chess is? Okay. Chess where you got the, it's, almost, it's not checkers. So if I say we play checkers and God's playing chess, it's like he's in a whole different ballpark, but he's right there with you. So when you want to checkmate the Lord, all you got to do is just humble yourself. He's got nowhere to go except do something for you for that thing right there because God will honor humility. He resists the proud. And so you're seeing the Lord working by his providence. Paul didn't expect to see Aquila and Priscilla. They didn't expect to see Paul, man, meeting Paul, the apostle. And then he probably got a good cook out of the deal because she made the wife probably cook. So he's got, he's got meals coming on the table. They work together. She's cooking. He's a Jew. They're a Jew. Anti-Semitism, uh, Semitism, so, and they get together. What is that? Those are people that God is sending in your life. Right. It's called the providence of God. Amen? Amen? Now, if you took a pen and you wrote down a list of all the people God has brought into your life, that you would be here where you're at. Still going to church. Still preaching from a King James Bible. There's a lot of people God has brought into our lives and honing and helping to hone us. And maybe we're, God's using us to help hone others. That's what you call iron sharpening iron. And that's the providence of God. God bringing good things, good people, even bad people to help hone us to be where we're at today. Amen, it's only by the grace of God and people God has brought in their life that we're in church. Amen. 2023. Only by the grace of God, as God's protective care by His providence and His providing care and uh, the timely preparation where it just happened to be that Aquila and Priscilla come from Rome, anti-Semitism, and meet the Apostle Paul, and then that's encouraging Paul along the way. And so you have, I, I think it was William Tyndale, he was strangled and burned at the cross, the stake with fervent zeal and with a loud voice as reported, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And by the providence of God Almighty, within about a hundred years, he got, he, got, uh, he got beheaded, I believe, or burned at the stake. And billions get a Bible because of a prayer like that. Amen. You're talking about the providence of God. And here he is happy as can be up there in the third heaven, up in there in that heavenly casino. And all he did was pull down that arm when he said that prayer, and the gold just keeps coming in. The gold just keeps coming in and coming in and coming in. and com Can you imagine that up in heaven? A guy prayed a prayer like that and died a martyr's death. All the rewards he's getting. Yeah. Whoo, my. Man, all oh, this world's money couldn't compare to what that man's got. Man. The providence of God when you know that all things work together for good, not some things work together for good, or all things work together for some good. No, all things work together for good, period. Man, that's the providence of God. And then uh, you have the people of God. Well, we won't turn there for the sake of time. 
in Philippians 4, 18, Paul was in a Roman jail. Here comes Epaphroditus. And then here comes uh, Acts 17, Silas and Timothy. And then uh, Gaius and Aristarchus uh, of Macedonia and Justice and Crispus in Acts 18. And all these people that God brought into the life of the Apostle Paul. So God is with you in His person. God is with you in His providence. God is with you in His people. And God's going to continue to encourage you and me through, through other people. And we can thank God for church. Amen. And people that are coming, and you got this camaraderie, and the spirit moving, and the book open, and the preaching going, we need that. Yes. Yes. We don't want to be so independent, so you have so much dependence on self or something else, you forget about interdependence in a local congregation. I mean, I'm for technology. I don't mind that, and I don't believe the Lord's against it, but as long as you don't let technology use you, you use the technology. You know, you don't be so dependent upon it that you just can't do without it. Now, you know, can you imagine, you know, Moses, he's praying when they're fighting against the Amalekites, and there's, uh, I forgot her and someone else there, holding up his hands, and he hears a beep. He says, hold on a minute, guys, I've got to get my phone. Yeah, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And then he comes back and says, sorry, I, I, you know, I was busy. So then here go the hands up again. You know, folks, when it comes time to just trying to get a hold of God, you have got to get away from that so then every time you don't hear the beep, you're not conditioned like a parrot or a dog or a, any other bird. Say, no, I'm talking with God. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, folks, I'll tell you, we have to be extremely careful and so God is with us in His person, and his, his presence is with us in His person, and in His providence, and in His people, and yet that presence of God is with you uh, in His power, yeah. because you got saved, and for the preaching of the cross of them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power Amen. of God. I'm not going to hell. Amen. I'm going to heaven. Amen. If, you, if you're saved, can you say amen? amen. Well, amen. then I'll see you there soon. Amen. We're going to heaven. We're on the way. Amen. We're going there. We're going to see all of heaven's glory. Amen. We're going to be up there for that judgment seat. And after that, and whew, it's going to be great. We're going to be clean as clean as possibly can be. And that gown, that bride's gown, and we're going to be riding on horses when we come back and you're going to be professional horse riders. Amen. Amen. And you're not going to fall off. Right. Amen. Can you imagine that giddy up horsey and whew, not giddy up, giddy up, down. We're going down. We're coming down from third heaven and we're coming down on a horse and we're going to fight and nothing bad is going to happen to us. Amen. And we're going to be on this earth as well as your feet are on that floor right there. You are going to be somewhere on this earth. Can you imagine that, folks? That is not uh, some emotional thing. That is not something personal. The book says it. We're going to be on this earth somewhere. Now, I don't know where you're going to be. Now, I want to know who's going to be the head honcho here in Rickman. I believe it would be, a, well, he's got to be saved. Then I believe he'd have to be a man that's stuck by a King James Bible. And he didn't throw the Bible out like John MacArthur, good man. He's apostate. Uh, uh, David Jeremiah and uh, uh, J. Vernon McGee and uh, uh, all these men, all these big men. You know what they are? They're stumbling blocks. You know how many people have stumbled because they do not want to believe that Bible right there? America started with this book right here. And God wants us to end with it. And too many have gone outside. I, we put a book together, translating the King James Bible into a foreign language by a decree of a king for all nations. You have one king over many, many languages. He has got the power. He proclaims a decree. It's committed to writing. It's uh, signed. It's sealed. It's translated. And then it's delivered. There are seven points completely outlined in the Old Testament showing you, you have got one king, one resource, and when you have a conflicting resource to go against the word of a king, his house would be made a dunghill. 
they'd burn his home. That's the wrath of a king. What about the wrath and the righteousness of God Almighty against those that hold the truth in unrighteousness? And people want to know why the tornadoes are coming and all the earthquakes are coming and all the destruction. We don't need a war. There's a war of God against our country because people have thrown God's word out. And I'm talking about a King James Bible, not a new King James. I didn't know you had American Standard here. I go to a Cracker Barrel and the toilets are American Standard. Now, isn't that something that doesn't God have a sense of humor? What he thinks about these versions? In short, I'll put it to you in Greek. They stink, okay? Okay, that's the original. Like one hillbilly said, the Bible was not written in the original Hebrew in the Greek. It was written in the original English. Amen, hallelujah. <laughs> All right, better get back to the sermon. All right, there's power. They talk about power, you know. 175 million horsepower for a spaceship to go up. Double A fuelers, drag racing, 300 miles plus per hour within four or five seconds. You talk about a lot of power. That's a lot of power. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. It's limitless. According to the power that worketh in us. That's resurrected power. That's a lot of power. It's in you. Resurrected power. What about the power of a personal witness? You know, here's the apostle Paul. He's in jail. And he's got to stand before the council. Do you think he just, he comes out and he says, well, wait a minute, I got to get my, uh, the last sermon I got from Adrian Rogers. He's got a point and a sub point and a sub sub point and a sub 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 point, then a point. No. The apostle Paul just came out and witnessed what happened to him. You're saved. You know what you have? You have the power of a personal witness to tell people what happened to you and how you got saved. There's power in that. You say, I just got saved. I don't know what happened, but I just got saved. He opened my eyes. I don't, I'm drinking water that's eternal water right now, and I'll never thirst again. I'm, I've got that drink of eternal life in me. Jesus saved me, and I'm going to heaven. Well, there's the power of uh, the, 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 the presence of God in his power to overcome suffering and sin. And then lastly, he is with you in his promises. You know, God is not going to ask you folks to do something he doesn't do himself. Does God want you to be faithful? Well, is not God full of faith? When God says something, he does it. When you find it in print, it's there. You can mark it down. He said it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you got it? You've got everlasting life. He said it, it's done. He's faithful. Amen. And so this is the law of faith where God says something and he promises you something and he's go going to enforce it. Because when God works in the law of faith, you can find the law of sin, the law of death, the law of the uh, spirit of life in Christ, and there's the law of, 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 of uh, faith. Romans 3.27. It's a law. Like there's, in the physical realm, you've got the law, what they call gravity, okay? It's a law. And it's enforced, unless you defy that law. So, here's the law of faith. God created that law of faith, and he's an enforcer of that law. We have laws in a constitution, but those laws aren't always enforced. But you can count on God. When he creates a law, he's going to enforce that law. That's right. So when you, brother or sister, take that little step of faith right there, God sees it. And he's obliged to meet you where you take that little step of faith. You don't have to take a big step. You take that little step. You take that step in the right direction. Any daddy, any mommy wants to see their boy or their girl taking the right step in the right direction. Amen? Amen? It may not be a big step, but it's a little step. And it's a step in the right direction. Right. And that's the law of faith. And God is faithful. And he's showing and manifesting his presence in his promises. So then when you just take him at his word and you say, okay, Lord, you're my heavenly father. There was a series long time ago called Father Knows Best. 
What happened to that? Father knows best. Well, that's not a popular series today. Well, our Father knows best for you. And He will manifest His presence to you in His promises. So He's manifesting His presence to you in His person, providence, people, power, and promises. Thank you very much.